Hello and welcome to this Unit 5 video lecture. In this unit, Unit 5, we will begin our examination of the epic conflict between the expanding Persian Empire and an alliance of Greek city-states. As you can see from the text, we're looking at a 20-year period from 499 to 479 BCE, in which we'll see what is largely a cold war occasionally turn hot, with two separate Persian strikes against the Greek mainland. And we'll look at the catalyst for this conflict, an event called the Ionian Revolt. But first, I want to begin by taking a brief look at the Persian Empire and who some of the key figures of the ruling dynasty were, the so-called Achaemenid dynasty. Now, before moving on to the next slide, please do note from this illustration that on the bottom you see the Greek hoplites battling with some mounted Persian warriors. And on the top, you see the primary weapon system that the Persians will deploy, the bow and arrow. The differences in weapons and tactics highlights the broader cultural gulf between the two sides. Now, any analysis of the Persian Empire must be framed by the realization that the Greek authors, like Herodotus, who provide our most abundant material on the Persian Empire, undoubtedly display a cultural bias in writing about the Persians, painting them in unflattering terms to contrast them with the Greek self-image as manly, virtuous, independent-minded. So, with that proviso in mind, let's explore a little background on the Persians. The Persians were part of a great eastward migration of Indo-European speakers from their homeland somewhere near the Black Sea. The Persians belonged to the Iranian branch of this migration and were one of several different nomadic horse peoples that moved into the area that is now modern Iran sometime around 2500 BCE. And of course, as nomads, they're very comfortable on horseback and quite adept at using the bow and arrow. Indeed, it was said of the Persians that from a very young age, Persian boys were taught three things, to ride well, to shoot straight, and to always tell the truth. Uh, the truth being a key reference to the Persian religious belief system known as Zoroastrianism, which stressed the opposition between truth or order and falsehood or chaos, and divided the world between followers of truth and those of falsehood. As was the case with all the other Near Eastern empires, Persia was a monarchy ruled by a king whose power was absolute. Uh, the Persian king was the earthly regent of the Zoroastrian god Ahura Mazda. And as a regent, the king was tasked with expanding the realm of truth by defeating the followers of falsehood. This theological imperative readily lent itself to a policy of imperial expansion. Now, the founder of what is historically known as the First Persian Empire, Cyrus the Great, will begin his long reign around 559 BCE and begin to lay down the foundation of what will become the largest empire in history up to that point. Now, the Persians were initially a subordinate group to another people called the Medes, located just to the north of Parsa, or what we would refer to as Persia. And the Medes will dominate the Persians for a while, and this will change, though, with the advent of Cyrus, who will lead the Persians first against their overlords, the Medes, and then against a number of neighbors. And eventually, this process of conquest will lay down that foundation for the very large empire, which uh, controlled by the time uh, Cyrus was in full command, uh, roughly this area colored red. 
But of course, Cyrus, with all of his campaigning, is taking risks, and he will be killed in the east, going up against another group of nomads. And here, there's a lesson to be learned, that perhaps by expanding too far, you may put yourself and all of your endeavors in jeopardy. And that's exactly what happens to Cyrus, and what will happen to future Persian kings a tendency towards overreaching. But Cyrus will get the ball rolling, and he will be uh, succeeded by his son Cambyses, who will conquer Egypt and bring that incredibly wealthy land into the Persian Empire. Now, next, with Darius, we see a further expansion of the Persian Empire to the east and into the borderlands of India, and to the west into Thrace. And Herodotus describes in great detail Darius's campaign against the Scythian people uh, north of Thrace, located in what is uh, now Ukraine. And this turns out to be, uh, again, an example of overreach. It turns out to be a real setback for Darius and the Persian Empire that up to that point had rarely, if ever, known defeat. And it is during the reign of Darius that the Greeks and the Persians will begin to get into a very serious confrontation. So we've talked about this region of what is now coastal Turkey as being dotted with Greek city-states, uh, this area called Ionia. Well, this area, Ionia, had been conquered by Cyrus in 546 BCE. Now, amongst these city-states, uh, there was one shining jewel, the city-state of Miletus, which is located here at the tip of my red arrow. The tyrant of Miletus was a guy named Aristagoras. Now, Aristagoras was also a very ambitious person, and he decides to take advantage of an opportunity that presents itself. When on the island of Naxos, a type of civil war erupted. This was a pretty common phenomenon in Greek city-states. Usually it was class warfare, the rich against the poor, and the Greeks had a term for it. They called it stasis. On Naxos, the aristocrats have all been ejected from the island, and they flee to Miletus, and they ask Aristagoras if there's some way he can help them regain control of their city-state. Now, Aristagoras doesn't have the resources himself, but he senses this opportunity to ingratiate himself with the Persians. So he goes to the Persian governor and pitches the idea of a joint operation to help the Naxian aristocrats take back their city-state. Aristagoras will supply some ships if the Persians supply some troops. The Persian governor agrees, and the expedition is launched. But right from the beginning, things begin to go wrong. On Naxos, the middling class who are in charge get tipped off that there is an invasion coming, so they mount an effective defense of their city-state. They are able to push back this invasion, and uh, of course the Persians don't like failure, and Aristagoras knows that he is now in trouble with the Persians. So Aristagoras does quite an about-face. He goes from being an ally of the Persians to suddenly inciting rebellion against them. Uh, he becomes the spark that ignites a broad Ionian revolt against Persian rule. Even he must have been surprised at how easy it was to get his fellow Ionians to make a bid for independence. Now, Aristagoras is shrewd enough to know that there is no way that the Ionians, with the limited military resources available, will ever be able to withstand the power of the Persian Empire. They need help. They need allies. So A Aristagoras heads to Greece, and he's going to travel first to Sparta and then to Athens, seeking military assistance. Now, unfortunately for Aristagoras, when he pitches his plan to the Spartans, uh, they refuse his request. 
Uh, the Spartans did not like to send significant military forces out of the Peloponnese for any lengthy time period because they were always concerned with a Helot revolt. Well, Aristagoras has better luck when he arrives in Athens. The Athenian assembly decides to help out the Ionians, in part because there was a kind of kinship relationship here, in which many of the Ionian Poleus looked to Athens as a type of mother city, and the Athenians themselves spoke the Ionian dialect. So the Athenian assembly votes to send um, these warships called triremes and a force of hoplites to Ionia to help out the Ionians. Another city-state, Eritrea, will also kick in a few triremes and some forces, but in total it's a very modest force, and unfortunately for the Greeks, it's not going to be enough to tip the scales in favor of the Ionians. But it will be enough, certainly, to bring down the wrath of Darius, who will be outraged that these Athenians are interfering in what he feels is a domestic matter of the Persian Empire. So the Athenians do arrive in Ionia, and they have an initial success. They wind up burning down the provincial capital city of Sardis, but that moment of success is followed by some pretty significant reverses, and the Athenians leave after a very brief deployment. But now they've involved themselves in Persian business, and the great king will not forget this. The Ionian revolt will last for about five years before it is utterly crushed by the Persians. Once the Ionian revolt has been crushed, King Darius is going to turn his attention to punishing Athens. And that's what we'll look at in the next video lecture.